Let's get back to our guidelines and we can go a little bit over. So let's see. Hang on. That would be here. Um, that's here. Okay. There we go there. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. We'll have to get that problem fixed. Okay, okay, so here we go. We are back um, where we left off. We're kind of rushing through that HIV infection and in, uh, pregnancy and childbirth. So uh, just to touch on that again, um, so it's that, it, that's a very important note, a coding note for us, is to um, know that whenever a patient is admitted for, um, with HIV asymptomatic infection status and they're pregnant or it's, they're having a baby, um, they should receive codes of O, 98.7 and Z21. And codes from chapter 15 always take sequencing priority. So that's a big takeaway from that. And so if you think about it, how I remember it is, you know, so OB codes always take uh, precedence, right? And they start with the letter O. So O, OB, you know, those are always um, take sequencing priority. It's just a little way I flag in my mind to remember that. So our last HIV guideline is H, encounters for HIV, for testing for HIV. If a patient is being seen to determine their HIV status, use code Z11.4, encounter for screening for HIV uh, disease, and use additional codes for any associated high-risk behavior. You know, IV drug use, that's an example of a high-risk behavior. A patient with signs or symptoms is being seen for HIV testing, code the signs and symptoms. An additional counseling code Z71.7 HIV counseling may be used if counseling is provided during the encounter for the test. And then when a patient returns to be informed of their HIV test results and the HIV test is negative, you'd use Z71.7 for the counseling um, if the results are positive, you would assign codes as appropriate. So if an HIV uh, result is positive and they have no HIV-related conditions, right, then it would be that uh, Z21 code. If they return and that HIV test is positive and they have all these HIV-related conditions, it automatically be the B20 code, or if they refer to it as AIDS. Um, and so just I want to clarify, too, that so where it says, um, if a patient with signs or symptoms is being seen for HIV testing, code the signs and symptoms. So I just wanna be clear, because I know we just talked about signs and symptoms and said don't code them if they're part of an integral disease or if there's a more specific code. Well, here, we don't have that more specific code. That's what they're getting tested for, and that's why we would code the signs and symptoms. We don't know yet if they're HIV positive or negative, so we code the signs and symptoms because we don't have a definite diagnosis. So that's a great illustration of that. Um, okay, and so let's move on and we're gonna get into our next um, guidelines, same chapter, uh, but now we're in infectious agents as the cause of diseases classified to other chapters. So again, these guidelines are all together in the front of the book without examples and they're in front of each chapter um, that they relate to with examples. So that's why we're using this format. Um, so certain infections are classified in chapters other than one, and uh, no organ organism is identified as part of the infection code. So in these instances, it is necessary to use an additional code from chapter one to identify the organism. A code from category B95, Streptococcus staph Delococcus and Enterococcus as the cause of diseases classified to other chapters. Let's see. How do I figure out C11.4 versus C71? Okay, so we just got a question. It's a good one. How do I figure out the Z11.4 versus Z71.7? So let's go back up there. <clears throat> 
Okay. So um, Z11.4 is the encounter for screening um, for human immunodeficiency virus HIV. And the Z71.7 is um, HIV counseling. So that's a really good question. Z11.4 is actually for the screen for the HIV virus, right? So we code Z11.4, they're coming in for their screening for HIV. Um, we're also gonna code any high-risk behaviors. And we counsel them. And so our provider is not only are they coming in for the screening, um, we're, we're seeing if they are, have high-risk behavior, but we're also going to offer counseling because they're visibly upset. They're really upset that they uh, don't have to get an HIV test and they're afraid that it's positive. And so our provider counsels them. So we'd use both codes. So we would use Z71.7 for HIV counseling if counseling is provided for the encounter, uh, during the encounter for the test. So Z11.4 for the screening, we're coding that. And we counseled the patient, so we're gonna get, use Z71.42. Now, if they come back and their results are negative, we don't use that Z11.4 again. They've already, we've already had the encounter for screening, but they come back, their results are negative, and we're um, counseling them about, you know, hey, in the future, this is what you'll wanna do so you don't have, you know, to come back and get another test, right? So um, they come back, their results are negative, we get to use that counseling code again, the Z71.7. And then if the results are positive when they come back, we don't, we use the actual HIV positive codes. But if a patient is there for their screening and we counsel them, we use both. If, they, if they're there for their screening and they get no counseling, we only use the Z11.4. If they come back, we only use the Z71.7, and that's only if the results are negative. So hopefully that cleared that up. Perfect. So that's great, you guys. Definitely using the chat feature, we can answer questions right away. So that's a great bonus to these. Okay, um, so again, these other infectious agents as cause of diseases classified to other chapters. So an example of this, right? Let's look for an example of this. So say you have osteomyelitis, right? Let's think about that in medical terminology. Osteo, bone, myle, muscle, itis, inflammation of. So osteomyelitis is actually like um, bone, it's eating the bone almost, right? So it's a serious, serious uh, condition. You know, you can use, lose your toe if you have severe osteomyelitis, or sometimes they can just take the skin or the fat and, and get it that way, but um, osteomyelitis. And why do you have it, right? So something caused that osteomyelitis. It's some kind of infection. Um, it's streptococcus. It caused the infection. So you'd, all, you'd code the osteomyelitis code, but you'd need an additional code for that um, reason, the infection, the actual infection itself. And so in a scenario, if, you got, if you're in the hospital and you have osteomyelitis of the toe, and it's funny because I just recently saw this, and you have osteomyelitis of the toe, and then you, um, you're in the hospital, you end up getting your toe amputated while the lab reports come back and the um, virus was, the infection was streptococcus. So we know what caused the osteomyelitis. We would code both of those conditions. But they give us another example, so we can just go on. So um, B96, other bacterial agents as the cause of diseases classified to other chapters, or B97, viral agents as the cause of diseases classified in other chapters. So. B95, B96, B97, those are all causes of diseases that are in other chapters. Osteomyelitis is an example of that. Um, an instructional note will be found at the infection code advising that an additional organism code is required. So in the case of osteomyelitis, under that code it says you use additional code from B95 to B97 to identify uh, organism. But here's the example they're giving us right here. 
it's E. coli UTI. So urinary tract infection, site not specified, uh, N39.0, and unspecified E. coli as the cause of the diseases classified elsewhere. Um, so an instructional note under the code for urinary tract infection indicates to code also the specific organism. And in this example, let's just hop over to that code so we can actually see it in, in our book. So right now, these um, chapter specific guidelines are on 424. So if we go to N39.0 in our ICD-10 book, And it's on page 752. So we have N39.0, and this is for 2016. N39.0, urinary tract infection, site not specified. I know you can't see my book, but. <clears throat> so underneath that, right, use additional code B95 through B97 to identify infectious agent. Exactly what we just saw in red. And so B95 through B97, those are those categories um, uh, that we just read through, right? So it would be one of those organisms. So moving on to C, infections resistant to antibiotics. And we're seeing this a lot more and it's been in the news a lot more often. People are like, oh, you know, we're putting so much antibiotics in our food that now we're resistant to it. Well, not only is that true, but we have a whole slew of codes that illustrate that. So many bacterial infections are resistant to current antibiotics. It is necessary to identify all infections documented as antibiotic resistant. Assign a code from category Z16, resistance to antimicrobial drugs, followed by the infection code, only if the infection code does not identify drug resistance. So let's look at this example. Antimyocobacterial anti resistant primary pulmonary tuberculosis. Code A15.0, tuberculosis of lung, and Z16.341, resistance to single antimycobacterial drug. And our rationale behind this is code Z16.341 is assigned as a secondary code to represent the antimycobacterial mycobacterial resistance. This, this code includes resistance to antimycobacterial drug NOS. Do you remember what NOS is? Not otherwise specified. If multiple drug resistance is not specified, classification defaults to the single drug resistance code. So that's letting us know that there's a single drug resistance code and then there's also a multiple drug resistance code, right? So if we want to look this one up, for example, we can go to Z16341. Okay, so Z16341 is on 1113, 1113 page. <laughs> And um, we can see uh, that Z16.34 needs a fifth digit. And so if we go down, we see Z16.341. And if you see the green um, term that is identified, single, right? And so if we rem remember the green um, identifies, and this was a great question by one of the students, the green identifies important terms, right? So this is, illustrates why it's important to pay attention to those girl, green terms. Single or multiple, right? So that changes our code. So whether the drug resistance is to a single drug or a, a multi, multiple drugs, it's going to change your code. So we need to pay attention to that. So if you were out taking the test and this was in one of your answers and you get here and you see Z16.341 and you look at that green term, single, you might want to just look at your question again and make sure that it's a single dr drug instead of multiple drugs because you can see it changes your code. Okay, so moving on to sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. 
this is one of the most um, it, this is one of the most frequently uh, miscoded diagnosis, right? Um, there's special guidelines around it, and a lot of times people get confused by it. But it's really simple if you pay attention to it, like it says in the guidelines, and then you you can see the examples provided. So coding of sepsis and severe sepsis, and it's actually a lot better than it used to be in ICD-9. That was a nightmare. So um, A, sepsis. For, diagnos for a diagnosis of sepsis, assign the appropriate code for the underlying systemic infection. If the type of infection or causal organism is not further specified, assign code A41.9, sepsis unspecified organism. A code from subcategory R65.2, severe sepsis, should not be assigned unless the severe sepsis or an associated acute organ dysfunction is documented. So, for regular sepsis, and if you don't have severe sepsis documented and you don't see any associated acute organ dysfunction, so what would that be an example of? That would be acute kidney failure. Um, then you would code that sepsis code. If it's documented as severe, it changes it to a different code here. So let's look at our example, gram-negative sepsis, right? So we have A41.50, gram-negative sepsis unspecified, and staphylocal sepsis, staphylococcal sepsis, staphylococcal sepsis, um, and A41.2, sepsis due to unspecified staphylococcus. Explanation. In both examples above, the organism causing the sepsis is identified. So they gave us two examples there. I kind of blew through, through, through them. So we had gram-negative sepsis and A41.50, that's the code for gram-negative sepsis, and staphyl staphylococcus sepsis, A41.2. So in both of these examples, the organism causing the sepsis is identified. Therefore, A41.9 sepsis, unspecified organism, would not be appropriate, as this code would not capture the highest degree of specificity found in the documentation. Do not use the additional code for severe sepsis unless it's documented as severe sepsis with acute organ dysfunction. So we can't code severe sepsis unless we have um, it documented. And this is a good example of coding to the highest specificity. So A41.9, sepsis unspecified, would not be appropriate for either of these two conditions, gram-negative sepsis or staphylococcal sepsis, because they're specifically, they're more specific. And so you would code to the highest specificity. Um, and next, negative or inconclusive blood cultures and sepsis. So negative or inconclusive blood cultures do not preclude a diagnosis of sepsis in patients with clinical evidence of the condition. However, the provider should be queried. So they're saying here that negative or inconclusive blood cultures of the diagnosis of sepsis in patients with clinical evidence of the condition that might not mean that they have sepsis or they don't, and you'd ask the provider. So in a situation where um, you just don't know as a coder and you can't query the provider, you have to resort to, if it's not documented, you don't code it. And if there's conflicting information, you don't code it. Moving on to urosepsis. The term urosepsis is a nonspecific term. It is not to be considered uh, synonymous with sepsis. And remember, synonymous, same. It has no default code in the alphabetic index. Should a provider use this term, he or she must be queried for clarification. So the reason this is even included, right, because it's not even a term um, used in the alphabetic index is because in ICD-9, the urosepsis was one of the most confusing parts of the coding sepsis. And so they wanted to really explain here that it's a nonspecific term and it's not the same as sepsis. Okay, um, moving along to sepsis with organ dysfunction. If a patient has sepsis and associated acute organ dysfunction or multiple organ dysfunction, which is um, abbreviated as MOD, follow the instructions for coding severe sepsis. 
So if sepsis is documented without the term severe and the associated acute organ dysfunction or multiple organ dysfunctions are documented, you would still code the severe sepsis. So you're, for severe sepsis, you're looking for acute organ dysfunction or multiple organ dysfunction to um, know that you're coding it correctly. Uh, acute organ dysfunction that is not clearly associated with the sepsis. If a patient has sepsis and an acute organ dysfunction, but the medical record documentation indicates that the acute organ dysfunction is related to a medical condition other than the sepsis, do not assign a code from category R65.2 severe sepsis. An acute organ dysfunction must be associated with the sepsis in order to assign severe sepsis. If the documentation is not clear as to whether acute organ dysfunction is related to the sepsis or another medical condition, query the provider. So what is this saying? If we have acute organ dysfunction and it's clearly related to a medical condition other than the sepsis and we have sepsis, we don't code the severe sepsis, right? And if we can't tell, um, then we'd query the provider. And in a situation where we can't query the provider, again, if, we are, if it's not documented and we don't know the answer, then we would not code it as severe sepsis. We would just code the A41.9. Here's an example. Sepsis and acute respiratory failure due to COPD exasperation. So our patient has sepsis and they also have respiratory failure and it's due to COPD and exasperation. We would code the A41.9 for our sepsis unspecified organism, J44.1 for our COPD, our chronic obstructive pulmonary disease with acute exasperation. And you see acute here in those parentheses, that is a non-essential modifier, which means it can be there, but it doesn't have to be there. That's just a reminder from our conventions. And J96.00, acute respiratory failure, unspecified as whether it ha we have it with hypoxia or hypercapnia. So our rationale behind that is, although we have acute organ dysfunction with the respiratory failure, and it's present in the form of acute respiratory failure, severe sepsis, code R65.2, is not coded in this example. The acute respiratory failure is attributed to the COPD exasperation rather than the sepsis. Sequencing of these codes would be determined by the circumstances of the admission. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, you can reach out with questions. Um, severe sepsis. So this coding of severe sepsis requires a minimum of two codes. That's an important little notation to remember. First, a code for the underlying systemic infection, followed by a code from subcategory R65.2 for severe sepsis. If the causal organism is not documented, assign code A41.9, sepsis unspecified organism for the infection. Additional code or codes for the acute organ dysfunction are also required. So we have um, severe sepsis, right? And we have to have a code for the organism behind that severe sepsis. And if we don't have that organism identified, we would use the A41.9, which is basically the unspecified sepsis organism code. And we'd use any additional codes for the acute associated organ dysfunction. So due to the complex nature of severe sepsis, some cases may require querying the provider prior to assignment of the codes. And that's true. Um, and if you're unable to query the provider, then again, if it's not documented, don't code it. Septic shock. Septic shock generally refers to circulatory failure associated with severe sepsis, and therefore it represents a type of acute organ dysfunction. So when you have a case of septic shock, the code for the systemic infection should be sequenced first. So with septic shock, it's giving us um, sequencing guidelines. Um, so the code for the systemic infection should be sequenced first, followed by R65.21, severe sepsis with septic shock, or code T81.12, post-procedural septic shock. 
So the difference there is the post-procedural septic shock. That's if you have septic shock and it's post you've had a procedure and it's following the procedure and now you are have septic shock. Um, any additional codes for the acute organ dysfunction should be also assigned. As noted in the sequencing instructions in the tabular list, the code for septic shock can not, never be uh, assigned as a principal diagnosis. Sepsis with septic shock, there's our example. And we have no um, specified organism, right? So we're gonna default to that A41.9, sepsis with unspecified organism, or sepsis of unspecified organism, and R65.21, severe sepsis with septic shock. In our rationale, documentation of septic shock automatically implies severe sepsis. So if you see septic shock documented, it's severe sepsis. Just get that in your head. Um, severe sepsis as it is a form of acute organ dysfunction. Septic shock is not coded as a principal diagnosis. It is always preceded by the code for the systemic infection. And if that systemic infection is unspecified, A41.9. So um, moving on, we have sequencing of severe sepsis. If severe sepsis is present on admission, and this is a good term to remember, present on admission, it's referred to a lot as POA, present on admission, and meets definition of principal diagnosis, the underlying systemic infection should be assigned as principal diagnosis, followed by the appropriate code from subcategory R65.2 as required by the sequencing rules in the tabular list. A code from subcategory R65.2 can never be assigned as a principal diagnosis, right? So we just went over that. When severe sepsis develops during an encounter, it was not present on admission, the underlying systemic infection and the appropriate code from subcategory R65.2 should be assigned as secondary diagnosis. Severe sepsis may be present on admission, POA, but the diagnosis may not be confirmed until some time after admission. If the documentation is not clear whether severe sepsis was present on admission, the provider needs to be queried. So from a coding perspective now, if, you are, if you're like coding for maybe a payer or you're coding for a vendor and um, you're really just verifying codes that, uh, the, that the provider or the hospital submitted, um, and they would be responsible for indicating whether a condition is present on admission or not. And, you know, part of that is uh, we data mining. They really want to start tracking what conditions are developed in the hospital, what conditions are hospital-acquired conditions or HACs. So we have present on admission, um, which would let us know whether the provider thinks or has determined a condition is actually present on admission, right? Um, some conditions are exempt from present on admission and there um, are specific codes that, that will let us know that. And I'm not sure uh, if we have it up already, but we have a list of present on admission exempt codes and we can upload that to uh, the current student portal as well. You won't really need it, but it, you might need it for future in your coding jobs. So moving on, and if you guys have to drop off, that's fine. Um, we're just gonna get through this section and then uh, we can wrap up for the day, but you can always um, watch it you know, later if you need to drop off. So sepsis and severe sepsis with a localized infection. If the reason for admission is both seps sepsis or severe sepsis and a localized infection like pneumonia or cellulitis, a code for the underlying systematic systemic infection should be assigned first, and the code for the localized infection would be a secondary diagnosis. If a patient has severe sepsis, a code from category R65.2 should be assigned as a secondary diagnosis. If a patient is admitted with a localized infection, such as pneumonia, and sepsis or severe sepsis doesn't develop until after the admission, the localized infection should be assigned first, followed by the appropriate sepsis or severe sepsis codes. So that's really letting us know that if, um, if the severe sepsis and localized infection is present on admission, right, then the 
underlying systemic infection would be sequenced first, followed by the localized infection. So the sepsis A41.9 would be coded first, followed by the code for pneumonia or cellulitis. But if the patient's admitted with the cellulitis or pneumonia and the severe sepsis develops after they're in the hospital, um, then that pneumonia or cellulitis is coded first, and then um, the sepsis is coded as secondary. Patient presents with acute renal failure due to severe sepsis from pseudomonas pneumonia. So we would code the sepsis first, then the pneumonia, then the severe sepsis without septic shock, then the acute kidney failure. So we're coding, as you can see, we're coding the underlying systemic infection first, the sepsis. And here's our explanation. If all conditions are present on admission, the systemic infection is sequenced first, followed by the codes for the localized infection, the pneumonia, severe sepsis, and any organ dysfunction. If only the pneumonia was present on admission um, with the sepsis and resulting in re renal failure developing later in the admission, the pneumonia would be sequenced first. So we just covered that. Um, five is sepsis due to a post-procedural infection. So documentation of a causal relationship. With all post-procedural complications, code assignment is based on the provider's documentation of the relationship between the infection and the procedure. Sepsis due to a post-procedural infection. For such case, cases, the post-procedural infection code, such as T80.2, infections following infusion, transfusion, or therapeutic injections. T81.4, infection following a procedure, or T88.0, infection following immunization, or O86.0, infection of <laughs> obstetric surgical wound, should be coded first, followed by the code for the specified infection. If the patient has severe sepsis, the appropriate code for subcategory R65.2 should be assigned, with the additional code for any acute dysfunction. So basically our sepsis guidelines are really just giving us every scenario possible and telling us how to code it. So post-procedural infection with post-procedural septic shock in cases where the infection has occurred and has resulted in severe sepsis, the code for the precipitating complication, such as, we just read that, no we didn't, sorry. Um, so the code, resulting, the code for the precipitating complications, such as the T81.4, O86.0, or R65.20, um, should, or I'm sorry, T81.4, the infection following a procedure, or O86.0, infection of obstetrical surgical wound should be coded first, followed by the severe sepsis. Um, without septic shock, that R65.20. A code for the systemic infection should also be assigned. So if a post-procedural infection has resulted in post-procedural septic shock, the code for the precipitating complication, such as the T81.4, infection following a procedure, or O86.0, infection of obstetrical surgical wounds, should be coded first, followed by T81.12, post-procedural septic shock and a code for the systemic infection should also be assigned. So that T81.12, remember, that is um, post-procedural septic shock. It has its own specific code if it's post-procedural. Okay, so actually I think we'll stop there um, because that's a lot of information to cover. And before we get into um, severe sepsis with a non-infectious process and also the staphylococcus, the MRSA um, conditions, we'll just go ahead and stop and we'll pick that up next time. Um, in the meantime, uh, this is already on the current student per portal, this PDF, but this is also in front of each of your chapters, chapter specific guidelines with examples. And um, there's more information on the portal as well. So you might want to check it out uh, and see if anything new has been added since the last time.
um, in a couple sessions or uh, maybe at the end of next week, we'll cover some additional resources that were added there that will help you with um, preparing to take your test. And uh, if you have any questions in the meantime, please either e email the e e r w i n at the coding spot .com or instructor at the coding dot instructor at the coding spot .com and we'll answer your questions as soon as we can. Um, and thank you for your questions. They're all great. You guys are doing a great job and uh, please reach out if you need any extra help. All right. Have a great day.